you are about to enter the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Coming soon to shockwaveskullsessions.com. And now your host, Bob Nalbandian. All right, we got the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. This is our debut episode. Uh, we, we did an intro well, episode, they, right, Matt? An intro, but this is the, the real debut. This is the this real the debut. debut, yeah. And what better way, or should I say, what better guest to have... Patrick Scott, my guest, I believe you were the guest on the first, yeah, uh, really? on the either Shockwave's Hard Radio, Shockwave Skull Sessions. Remember that? Yeah. I remember it well. Dude, how is this for old oh, school? ironic, huh? Yes. <laughs> and of course, we got Matt Hornet, <laughs> my producer here. We just built, a, Matt just built out this little studio. We're still kind of experimenting here. And we thought we'd call up Patrick and just kind of wing it. Talk about some of the old school days. Sounds great. So, Patrick, you're, you're obviously <laughs> living in Kansas City now, and uh, people that and don't... I'm in Minneapolis now. Dude, why do I keep saying Kansas City? You're in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Wow. Okay. I did live there for a little while, for well, for about six or seven years, but I've been here now for 20. That's right. I know. I visited you there. I, I don't know why Kansas City's always on my mind. Minneapolis, how's the scene out there <laughs> these days? I know you just saw Metallica about a week ago, right? Yeah, uh, that show was actually... <laughs> Funny enough, was actually in Kansas City. <laughs> that, that, that's probably why I'm thinking that, because you did mention Kansas City. Uh, yeah, I saw him here in September, and then uh, flew, and then actually drove down uh, last week and saw him on uh, Wednesday last week in Kansas City. Yeah, they uh, they hadn't been in Kansas City for 11 years. You know, the crowd was really excited, and it was you know they set another attendance record. I think they did in almost every show on that leg of the tour. They set attendance records because they hit a bunch of cities that they. Uh, hadn't played for a long time. Yeah, I thought that was really so, cool. They did a lot of the B markets because uh, here in California, I saw them at Fresno, and I think they hadn't played Fresno in like 19 years or something like that. And they played, okay. you know, Sacramento, uh, which they hadn't played in a while, and some uh, uh, some of the B markets, which I thought was really cool that they did. Yeah, and they told me they set attendance records everywhere. Right yeah, so on. they're uh, and the crowd is really into it. Uh, for those that don't know, Patrick Scott and I, we're like a old school, I guess. Was it high school? High school? Or maybe we just got into college. We were uh, 16. No, we were like 16. Yeah, we were definitely high school guys uh, going around record stores, uh, tape trading. We uh, started uh, getting into the early fanzine and tape trading scene way back in 1980, 81. And we grew up in Huntington Beach. And of course, Pat, you were one of the first people, I believe you and John Cornerans were one of the uh, first people Lars had met when he moved down to Newport Beach and... You became really good friends with Lars. You introduced me to Lars, and we used to go to his uh, apartment or his condo in Newport Beach, and he would make these killer compilation tapes, and we would just freak out on his record collection. And uh, just so uh, people know our little history, we go way back. Was that what it was? Was that eighty or eighty one? When uh, it was late eighty nineteen eighty. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So he moved uh, to the states. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Because Lars said he came down in like seventy nine to visit. And then he, uh -huh. and they moved down, I think, in 80, yeah. Yeah, he came here to be a tennis player, and he realized that wasn't the thing for him. And, you know, he always had a thing for the heavy bands. And, uh, yeah, I just answered a recycler ad, the want ad paper, because he listed bands that, besides you, Bob, I didn't know anybody that liked that kind of music. So I called him, and it was this guy with an accent I couldn't quite place. And we, we immediately started talking about... Um, you know, the New Wave British Heavy Metal bands, and he asked me, you know, if I had, like, the Lead Weight compilation, and he asked about the first Raven single and the first Angel Witch album, and then he said, man, you need to come down and check out my my record collection. So I, you know, drove the made the 20-minute drive down to Newport from Huntington and, you know, just started drooling over his record collection. Yeah, I remember he made you a compilation tape that had a bunch of uh, Diamond Head, EF band, uh Stuff like Hollow Ground and Black Axe, their first single, Red Lights. Uh, God, what else was on there? I, Angel Witch, like the their rare their B sides, like Flight Nineteen and Extermination Day. And I have the actual tape in my hand right now. <laughs> Par wow, nice. Parallax was another band. Well, what else was on there? Okay, so he put. Uh, he loved the uh, Nighttime Flyer single, the Heavy, heavy metal, metal Rules. Rules, Heavy Metal Rules. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> he thought it was just the heaviest thing, and I think it was it was out of tune and everything. But but uh, he just thought it was the heaviest thing. Yeah. And then he put a uh, Raven 
Wiped Out, uh, Iron oh. Maiden, Burning Ambition, because I hadn't heard that song. That's right. That was like the B-side to their first single, right? Their uh, Soundhouse tapes or something. Right. And then Black Axe, Red Lights, um, right. The Crucifixion, Single Death Sentence. Ah, that was the and, other band. That's right. Yeah, and then the um, EF band, uh, like you mentioned, the three A-sides of their, their singles, uh, Self-Made Suicide, Devil's Eye, and Night Angel, and then Demolition, the Hooker Hater. Ah, track. that's right, Hooker track. Hater. Track. Yes. And then Sledgehammer. Oh, struck the, me like uh, a sledgehammer. Exactly. And the then uh, the Hellenbach single, uh, out, uh, out to Get You, and um, Let's Get the Show on the Road. Was that on that first one? I thought Hellenbach came a little later. Uh, well, it was on this tape uh, oh, wow. that I'm okay. looking at now, yeah, and... Uh, and then uh, an Angel Witch Extermination Day, Flight 19, the, the Parallax, Parallax EP, yeah. Yeah, and then Split Beaver, The Hounds of Hell. Ah, yes. And then the Tigers uh, singles, Rock and Roll Man and Straight as a Die. That's right. And then the That's Hollow right. Ground single, uh, Fighting with the Devil and Holy One. And then a funny after to that was he put uh, Trust on there, the Lay Elite track. Ah, yeah, I love that tune. Well, they were kind of, yeah, kind of even though they're from too. France... They were kind of thrown yeah. in with the new wave of British heavy metal, yeah. And so yeah, was kind of Bow like Wow. Did, didn't he tape you some Bow Wow albums as well? Yeah, he recorded. Uh, he loved the Signal Fire album, right? And Silver Lightning. I, and... I heard a story that he, and, yeah, that he and James wanted to meet Kyoji Yamamoto, and that when they went to Japan, they they searched him out and found him because they wanted to meet him. He's a really nice but, guy. Uh, I got him on Facebook. He's a, a uh, really, big, big uh, photographer now. Yeah, great dude. What great! That's one of my all-time favorite albums. I mean, if anybody, that Signal Fire album is such a great album. And dude, that was like 1976 or 77, right? And, uh, I mean, way before yeah, Loudness. Was, uh, Everyone kind of credits Loudness uh, of being the first Japanese band, but Bow Wow was a heavy band. Uh, you know, Warning from Stardust. Uh, all those uh, those albums were classic. Yeah, they really are. Yeah, and then he also recorded uh, the first Legend album. He loved the first Legend uh, album. Yeah. And uh, which is another one of my all time favorites. Pete Hayworth on my, uh, his brother was in town, Neil, who ended up playing on some of the latter legend stuff. And uh, we had them on the Inside Metal show on T Radio V. And Pete kept calling in saying, Hey, you got to get Lars to do a legend song. I heard he was a big legend fan back in the day. We're the one band he never covered. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't. They could have done a great job on a lot of those. Just about any song on that first album, they would have just. It would have done a great job. Oh, dude, that, on it. that is, I still think uh, the first album, the, the self title, and then Death in the Nursery are two of the greatest albums, musically and lyrically. I mean, Pete Hayworth, just such a genius. I mean, way ahead of their time and just so heavy. And you talk about all the doom metal stuff that followed. That was like the original, just so dark and eerie. And yeah, when I listen to it, uh, even now I hear things that I didn't hear before, like harmonies and. You know, it's uh, such a deep album, It's uh, but easy to absorb, too. You know what I mean? You can listen to it and just feel the heaviness, but it just goes so deep. Totally. You know, you and I, we're, we'll do a, a, a separate podcast and go through like some uh, some really underground new wave of British heavy metal. But uh, on this uh, show, I want to talk about some of the, um, you know, just talk about back in the day, man, when we met some of the early shows we went to. I know you and I, we used to go record store shopping. You know, you and I had just met weeks before Brian Slagle and John Cornarens at a record swap meet. This is before they were doing, you know, long before uh, uh, Metal Massacre when he was doing the new heavy metal review. You remember the Hollywood record swap meet at the Roosevelt Hotel? Oh, yeah, totally. And I, I also remember going to uh, Oz Records where he worked. And right. uh, we'd stand there and talk to him for hours. We would drive up from Huntington metal, Beach. Yeah. This is what we did. We would drive up over an hour to, what was that, Woodland Hills. So that was at least an mm -hmm. hour drive just to go record store shopping and, and, and find killer records. Everyone we knew, we knew Ron Quintana. We had just started being a pen pal with him. We knew, you know, Cornarens and uh, uh, Mike Varney and, and all these guys. And all these guys Lars knew personally. He went and hung out with. So, you know, talking yeah. about small world. And the other thing that was funny is I remember you told me he started working with the singer. And then you said, Bob, you know the singer. Every time we were at the Woodstock, he's always staring you down. <laughs> yeah, remember I remember that. that. And it was James. Yeah. And he would always check out my jacket. I had a jacket with all these patches on. And everyone would give me shit about the patches because they think like I'm a, some biker trying oh, yeah. trying to be some <laughs> tough ass biker guy, and uh -huh. I would get shit. What the fuck is a motorhead? What is this? So I would just kind of ignore him, thinking he's wanting to kick my ass. And then 
we had met him later after we found out he was started to sing with Lars. And he said, dude, I love your jacket. I love all these bands. Remember that? I think people looked at those bands because nobody knew who they were. But it was funny because I remember James, first time we met him, he was wearing a Motley Crue shirt. And then the second time he was wearing a Motorhead shirt. And that's when we yeah. kind of approached him. And then after that, he was wearing a Venom shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember seeing him at a lot of shows at Radio City and Woodstock before I knew he was, like you said, before. And maybe he didn't know Lars yet. I don't know. But Yeah, he was in Leather Charm I, then. I used to see him. He was at August Red Moon, Dante Fox. Uh, Snow. Uh, I think when we went and saw Motley Crue there at Woodstock, he was there as well. Oh, I remember yeah. going to see uh, Motley Crue at Radio City, and I I was with you. you know, Motley we, we Crue, into- Rat, and Sound Barrier, right? Yeah. yeah. And I remember I bought like three or four of the the Motley Crue single, and they're like, "Boy, you're really a fan." It's like, no, I'm really not. <laughs> but I'd send them to pen pals, you know. I didn't keep any of them. I'd send them all out just to Good. see what Bruce I could get Nikki back. Bruce Nicky Six's ego. <laughs> That's right. You know that was funny yeah. about back then. We were just so we were kids, and we we're just so honest. If we would say shit like that, we you know, especially when I look back at some of the fanzine shit I used to write back then. I was like, God damn, I had some fucking balls back then. But I was like, you were young and you didn't care. You were just being honest. No, I'm not really into you. I came to see the other band. <laughs> Before that, before we got together in the early 80s, there were so many cool shows. Long Beach Arena. Now, you saw like ACDC with Bon Scott, right? Highway to Hell tour at Long Beach. I did, yeah. And I, yeah, I just found that ticket stub, and that show was $8.50. Yeah, oh, man. September wow. 1979. And Bon died in February of 80s. So we saw one of the last shows of Bon Scott, oh, man. Wow. Yeah. Horrible. You remember they cut the Long Beach Arena in half, so it was like half the arena. I remember that, yeah. And I don't know if... If you did this, but uh, with almost all those concerts, we'd go to the Raspberry Roach. Did you ever go there? In Long Beach. Well, right. Raspberry Roach was in Huntington. It was on Beach Boulevard, and it was basically a bong shop, and they kind of secretly sold tickets, and we'd, we'd go in and say, hey, we want ACDC tickets, and they'd say, yeah, we got six row, but it'll be $35. Wow. And my brother and I would pool our money together and just like, we'd have to walk away and discuss it, and... We started calling them the Raspberry Ripoff because they charge so much for tickets. But we're so, my brother and I talk now, and we're so glad we did that because we always got six row seats. I mean, for Priest and, you know, ACDC and Maiden and, you know, Maiden when they opened for UFO there. Oh, yeah. I was at that show. That was classic. Uh, yeah, the and then Killers Rush tour, goes. We, 81. Yeah, we get six row to see Rush. and I always heard about Raspberry Roach. I remember the head shops because there was a head shop in Costa Mesa. That's where I got all my patches. And that was before, like, the record stores were carrying them. So I don't know if these mm-hmm. dudes were fans of metal, but they because they all imported shit out of England. I, yeah, I didn't know about one in Costa Mesa. Yeah, uh, that was, I think Steve Hallis or Alan Dominguez told me about that. And they had, you know, I swear about the overkill, you know, the Motorhead overkill patch and the Saxon patch. And, you know, this is like early 81. You yeah, know? All, everybody I know would go camp out in front of like, I think it was Montgomery Wards had a Ticketron, yep, which was yep. like Ticketer. They wouldn't get good tickets. And then we'd go to Raspberry Roach and, and pay, you know, to pay to back then that was a lot of money. I wonder if and that we, was illegal back then, kind of bootleg, because you had, uh, I don't know if you remember, a lot of the record stores in Anaheim and some of the different places like Pepperland and different places, they would sell bootlegs in the back room, but you had to kind of know them, because bootlegs, you could, I mean, you, you remember yeah. at the, at the uh, swap meet, they would have raids really? at Matt, they would actually have wow, really? the, uh, what do you call it, Vice Squad or whatever and come Somebody in and raid. For, for, for imports. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and of course, we, wow. we all collected. Even Brian Slagle was a huge bootleg collector because you wanted, you know, if, if, you, if you were a big Rainbow fan, you, know, you mm-hmm. want to hear Stargazer live. They didn't sure. have that on the <laughs> live album. And you wanted to get, you know, the, the Maiden bootlegs or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. band, Judas Priest, you know, songs so that I weren't on, it, right? Unleashed. Yeah. yeah, that was the only way to get it. And uh, But yeah, I, I do remember it was kind of like a real underground thing, but it was kind of cool. Yeah, there was even, um, I remember there was mailing lists, you could, mail lists you could get from, I don't remember the names of the company. Well, well, it started with that R. He, he used to, I used to order bootleg cassettes from him. It was in Circus Magazine, right? Yep, R- exactly. Robin, yeah. yeah, and it was funny because I remember talking to Quintana about him and, and he used to order tapes from him too. He had a killer list of shit. I remember I ordered a, a couple old um, uh, rainbow tapes uh, from 1976, Osaka. Oh, yeah. I remember I got one from him that was 
a great a Judas Priest live, and I don't, I don't remember where it was from, but it was incredible. It was, it was like it was like ninety minutes of Unleashed in the East. It was so it was, it was just sounded just like that. Uh, you know, there are great versions plus a lot more songs, and I ended up loaning it to Lars. Did and I never got back? it back. Uh, I didn't. I would sue that fucker, man. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing was though that he loaned me the two uh, official bitches sin demos right i ah, still have those revenge. in my possession yeah there was a good trade actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> well if you remember uh, the original uh judas priest live uh on the japanese import was called the priest in the east and it had that bonus a uh, seven inch single that had like starbreaker delivering the goods it had four extra tracks right i remember yeah. that it wasn't uh did, did it have beyond the realms of death on it or i don't know i know it had starbreaker delivering the goods and I think something else, like run, uh, no, Running Wild was on the album. Uh, oh, didn't uh, it have Hellbound Brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So, Matt, I'm in, man. man. But, uh, oh, I'm listening to you guys, man. I'm, I'm learning a lot here. I mean, I was uh, a little pumped when you did stuff. So it's like, it's, it's interesting to me just hearing you guys talking about this, you know? Yeah. yeah. I was just starting to get them, you know, I was like, what? That time I was about five, six years old in 79, yeah. 80, you know what I mean? <laughs> did you Where see? Where did you grow up, Matt? I grew up in New York City. Oh, okay. Wow. That would have been a great place to grow up. You probably saw great shows too, though, didn't you? I did. I mean, I did. You know, obviously CBGBs and stuff. You, know, you had like, some yeah. cool clubs out there. That was. I remember when I used to when I worked at Roadrunner uh, in mm. LA, they would fly me out to New York. This is ninety one mm. or so. Okay. You had the limelight. Remember the oh, limelight? The limelight. The that, was, that was my favorite. Oh, fucking dude! Place, man. Sunday oh. nights was like metal Sunday, night. Yeah, exactly. This place had like three well, or they, four they levels. Had, like, all these secret rooms yeah. and shit, man. It, it was, was like, it was like just, Peter Gation was the guy's name who ran that place. That was yeah. a great fucking club. I mean, that was. That was my, that place, Coney Island High. It, it was uh, Brownies. It was, it was yeah, but yeah. Line, line, I'm, I'm glad you've been there, man. Oh, that place, dude, that place was awesome. Kicked yeah. ass. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I mean, you had the Cat House and places. Well, it was like an old that. church. Yeah, it was an old church. Yeah, yeah. stained glass yeah. windows. Yep. Yeah, and it was just. Great, and I, yeah. I remember first time I stayed at the Gramercy, I would walk over there. You know. I, yeah, I, I, exactly. Yep. And and it was a yeah. Sunday and till, till four in the morning, Every, packed. Yeah. Sunday, Sunday nights. Sunday nights was Sunday, a middle nights. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable place to hang out. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I almost got drunk walking back to my hotel. I you know back then. Probably, I was probably York. pretty stupid of me. I didn't be yeah, thinking, oh, I'm going to just walk. Yeah. It was dangerous as hell. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, ever seen, kind of stuff, well, yeah. you were a little, little, little young. This was the late 70s yeah. when like, bands like Riot. Oh, yeah, no, I love Riot. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I never saw Riot, but of course I love Riot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't really what about the themselves. Rods? Oh, they're, they're another upstate band because yeah. they were from they were from Portland. Portland. Yeah, James, yeah. Uh, James uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Pat, I was going to yeah. ask you. I know growing up in Huntington Beach, I mean, we were like the punk rock mecca then, and all my buddies were punks, and I was always the, the metal guy. And I know you were too. But did you go? To, did you ever go to the Cuckoo's Nest or see any of those old punk shows back in the day? Yeah, I was going to mention that because I I did go to a lot of punk shows, and I wasn't super into punk, you know, punk rock, but. It was, it was what was really cool about it is I'd you know I'd wear an Angelwood shirt at, or I'd wear a Motorhead shirt or a Raven shirt, and the punks all knew who those bands were. But I'd go to a metal show and nobody like oh, yeah. you know you and like Cornarens and Slagle, nobody else knew those bands. Well, you know why a lot of the punks because like a lot of the stores like Zed Records they carried in yeah. Long Beach they were like the big punk store they carried a lot of metal. I mean you you had two different punks you had the, the punks. That just hated anything long hair. Oh, you're sure, a hippie. Yeah. You're a, that had to go too. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a girl. Totally. And then you had the open-minded yeah. punks, and the open-minded punks loved Motorhead. But did you go to the Cuckoo's Nest, Pat? I did. Yeah, I oh, would sure. go see like uh, like T S O L, and I saw the Vandals there. And okay. see, I saw um, the Vandals and the Dickies and bands like that at Metal Arc in Huntington. That was a little bit later. But the Cuckoo's Nest, I just heard these crazy stories about that. And uh, Zuby's next door. Remember Zuby's? Yeah, <laughs> you, you know the Vandal song "Urban Struggle." I won't. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. all about Zubies and the Zubies. Oh, wow, really? uh, Zubies was a country bar right next, and okay. I think they did it purposely. They have a country bar, total redneck bar, right next to a punk rock bar, and just it fights seems every so fucking movie, night. Right? I mean, yeah. it, was, it was just <laughs> insane. Did you see that movie Clockwork Orange County, Pat? It's all about the cuckoo's nest. Uh, Jerry Roach and they inter huh. and they have all this old footage from back then, and they talk about Zubies. It's a great documentary. You can find it on Amazon oh, Prime. Check it out. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely check it out. Zuby's carried on to even the concert factory, and they would really? fuck with the metal guys. No, even, uh, most of the, the, the punk bands, too, were all from Orange County, right? I mean, at that point, a lot right? of them. Yeah, yeah that was all of them. Orange. You had the Huntington Beach, and then you had the well, Florida. Well, the beach areas, right? Because even in the 80s, right, you had the beach areas, And right? that, yeah. and Redondo Beach area, I think a lot of those bands, uh, Circle Drift, okay, Black, Black Flag. Like they came from but there, it, yeah. it was all the beach chants, and well, then you had Fullerton, yeah. too, the, the Black Flag. Social D, right? It's from Fullerton? Yeah, yeah. So you had a lot of that shit. But, dude, I remember, and this is fucking embarrassing. I got my, I almost got my ass kicked by a chick at Zuby's. <laughs> oh, shit, bro. <laughs> dude, were you there with me, dude? Pat, were you there? Was that a... I don't know if that was a Metallica show or... Uh, I remember I was at, uh, again, because of my jacket. I'm, I'm 16 years old, right? Skinny little fucking uh, kid with this jacket. And I, it wasn't even a denim jacket. It was, you remember my windbreaker? It was like a nylon windbreaker. I couldn't afford denim. You know? So I'm with this nylon windbreaker with these Judas Priest motorhead and Saxon and uh, Iron Maiden patches. So I look like this total wannabe totally. biker guy. Like I, and, and So I would get fucked with by people because they, they didn't know who these bands were. And I just remember going to, no, it was an August Red Moon show at Concert Factory. Because I remember Cord and Dave, so this, this chick comes out of Zuby's all drunk. And this chick was big. She was, a, I mean, yeah. you know, not just fat, <laughs> but a big bone. I mean, a real big chick. And she starts like fucking with us. And then she looks at me, what are you, a biker? What, who do you think you are? You're a tough guy, huh? And then she starts pushing me. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, fuck. So you know, you're I, worried about guys fucking with you. Now you get this fucking Yeah, and I'm trying you, to be right? cool. Like, yeah, I be, oh, no, I, no chick's going to fuck with me. And, of course, uh, Dave and Cord, who were there, they're like total smart asses from August Red Moon. They're like, Cord was like the road manager. Like, kick her ass, Bob. Go kick her ass. He, he hates women. He hates country music. You know, so she, they're egging her on. And she's like, bashing me up up against this wall literally like i'm trying to play it off like oh let's go okay okay cool right, you made your point i'm cool uh -huh. boom it just bashed me and like and then finally <laughs> she just like goes and i'm like i'm totally withered my I, I literally breath knocked out of me and i'm like oh man that was cool man that was cool and they're like laughing and i'm trying to play it off i'm like ready to play no, it off yeah, yeah, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. but after that i, I was scared to go to the concert factory i always thought that chick would find me Wait. That crazy chick from Zuby's, goddamn. <laughs> anyway, that's my that's my moment of embarrassment. So I'm not scared to tell these stories. <laughs> I don't remember that story. I miss a lot of the Metallica shows. Were you there when Brad Parker played? I was, and I. Do you know about this, Matt? No. What's this? I, 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 go ahead, lead into this, uh, Pat. So the, the day of that show, Lars came over to to my parents' house where I lived. You know, I was you know 16, 17 years old, and. He he said, "Okay, this is the 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 new lineup." And he wrote James Hetfield vocals, Dave Mustaine lead guitar. Uh, what was the guy's name again? I can't remember his name. Brad Parker. Yeah, and he put Brad Parker rhythm guitar, Ron McGovney bass, and Lars on drums. He said, "So this is a new lineup. So if anybody asks any of the pen pals, this is our new lineup." And I'm going, "Well, who's Brad Parker?" And he goes, "Yeah, we just hired him. He's going to play the show tonight." So he must have learned the whole set, like, really fast. Well, he was a really and, good uh, guitar player. He played with Odin, uh, I believe, Odin, after, really? yeah, yeah, wow. after Metallica. But he was, he trained with Randy Rhodes, apparently. He recently passed away, I heard. But he was, uh, he became, like, a famous archaeologist. Really? Wow. And made, made a ton of money. But he was, really? uh, like, every, I, I think he was in a band with John Bush years ago. And everyone said he was, like, a... Because uh, he studied with Randy Rhodes uh, uh, back in the day. But, yeah, he was um, quite known in the Pasadena area. Yeah, I remember him. He didn't fit in at all with the band. <laughs> right. But And they, they fired him the same night. I, I felt bad for the guy, but they uh, he just didn't fit in at all. But, well, well there's know, rumors. Did he actually play the show or did he play half the show? And then they didn't he do like a guitar solo and then they kicked him out in the middle of the show or something? I've heard different yeah. stories. I, I don't remember. I thought he played the whole show, but he, uh, and that's when, you know, James just wanted to sing, you right, know, because right. they were so into Diamond Head. He wanted to be, they wanted to have that look and be like Sean Harris. I actually still have that piece of paper that Lars wrote that down on. And uh, so it's kind of historic because it probably doesn't exist other, because it only happened for one day, you know. So, so but, Pasadena uh, had a, a scene. Had a, Pasadena a scene had a really good scene, yeah. yeah. 
LA was so separate. You had Hollywood, which was kind of so the glam huge, stuff. Man. It's just so huge. You know? Yeah, and Orange County. You had the you had, you had your own scene in Orange County, mm-hmm. the Woodstock, Radio City, and the Concert Factory, and all the heavier bands. Like that's where okay. we saw Slayer's first shows. When okay. Slayer was a cover band, Metallica's first right, shows at Radio they City. They couldn't play Hollywood. So exactly. Yeah. So they would play the outskirts. Yeah. Then you had the Pasadena clubs, Pookies, and that's where like Motley Crue started in Pasadena. Yeah, Van Halen started yeah, in Pasadena. Yeah, Halen, so yeah. you had Armored Saint, you know, Stormer, Smile. Mm-hmm. All those bands would play there before they so would So it was more of a geographical sure. thing where the, like, the bands that were just in that area played there? Or was yeah. it just more that like they just could book shows there and they were able to get... Well, Pasadena know? was considered more kind of like East L.A., so you yeah. had a lot of the okay. heavier bands. Okay. Uh, uh, and same with Orange County. It was a little bit heavier. Where uh, And then you had the Valley, which, you know, the country club. And you had to be well, really yeah, so big yeah. to play the country. They okay. had national So that was the top. Uh, that was the top, club, okay. yeah. Yeah, I didn't make it out to any of those Pasadena shows. Yeah. yeah I remember seeing uh, Slayer at Woodstock when their whole set was covers. Yeah. Judas and there was, no, there was nothing to do with speed metal. But I remember... But you know, before they came on, No Life Till Leather was playing in the in the Woodstock, and I don't know if they played it or if the Woodstock was playing it. But they were playing the demo before the band came on. But Slayer were, were, had nothing to do with speed metal yet. It was they were playing Priest covers and. Oh, and so then you, all you, of a sudden, you, you saw them. Huh, when oh, yeah, yeah. Because I remember when they first started doing the thrash, you know, they this one Metallica came out with their, you know, No Life to Leather, and Venom came out with Welcome to yeah. Hell, and that yeah. changed the whole sound. And, you know, as, sure did, as Stephen yeah. Craig said in the, the, you know, the original Mandarin, they, they just scrapped all their that was early it, they just, stuff. They and they had other songs like, you know, Dragon Slayer and other stuff that were more kind of just regular metal. But Kerry was, and still is, uh, you know, he always admitted a huge Judas Priest. ACDC fan, Dio, yeah. love Dio. They used to come to my house all the time and watch videos. I had oh, yeah. I had one of the early Betamax recorders. Remember that patent? And people oh, like, I this is crazy. Yeah. But weekends, they okay. would come over and fold my, my Headbanger magazine to run ads, and I'd do articles on uh-huh. They would have them all in my living out, room, and they would help them fold oh, them. Sweet. We would watch metal wow. videos of the uh, Witching Hour by Venom, awesome. and, and before that, yeah, I remember you know, that. the... Uh, bon Scott, uh, Rock Goes to College with ACDC. And, oh, and Rocky from Suicidal would drive from Culver City to come to Huntington Beach just to watch these Uli Roth videos of uh, Taken by Force, you know, Sales oh, of Charon. Really and, oh, he's a huge Uli fan. And, and uh, Michael Shanker. I know him from back in the day. Huh? Yeah, Rocky. that was when oh, I first damn. met him. Hey, Pat, pre- didn't you say you saw Priest at the Starwood or did you see him at the Civic on the uh, I saw him at Santa Monica Civic. Fuck, I missed yeah. that. Yeah, and it was that was like right like when Unleashed was you know the big thing and yep. like my favorite album at that point and uh, Still is so that, that was favorite. exciting to see them yeah yeah my parents would drop us off I can't even believe that they would do this but they drop my brother and me off and then they'd go out to dinner and pick us up after the show I remember the first time my dad dropped me off at the Woodstock I was I, I wasn't driving I think I was fifteen and my cousin was in town so I said oh you, know, you remember the White the Led Zeppelin tribute band. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. They were really fucking good. They ended up getting a deal. Michael White got a deal with Atlantic shortly after. But they did Mm. a kill. They were, before the tribute bands were around, there was The White and there was Randy Hansen that did the most unbelievable tribute to to Jimi Hendrix. And those were like really the only two big tribute bands. But The White played Orange County all the time. And my dad dropped us off at the Woodstock. And after that, you know, he saw fights in the parking lot, people oh, you, smoking. You, you his parents yeah. must have fr- like, freaked oh, out. Oh, they, they freaked out. Yeah. Man, well, know? he said after that, I could any time I went out, I had to borrow my mom's car. You know, when I when I first turned, he didn't 16, want to be involved with that. All anymore. I had to <laughs> say I was going to see a movie. That's why my curfew was always at at midnight. So I'd be hanging out with Pat and uh, Metallica after the show in, in the Radio <laughs> City parking lot, and I would try to act cool, like, "Oh, it's it's midnight. I got my buddy's having another party. I got to go to another party." But I was actually on curfew. <laughs> You, I had to get the car home, but I'm trying to act cool. <laughs> yeah, I remember I went to, uh, my parents dropped us off at the Long Beach Arena for one of those shows, and the, my mom came to pick us up, and I got back in the car, and I go, Mom, what's blow? Some guy just offered me some blow. <laughs> and she knew what it was. I don't know how she knew, but. Wow. And wow. then my parents would also, uh, like if the shows were at Santa Monica Civic, they'd drop us off. And there were members of a club, a place that's still there called the Magic Castle. It's in Hollywood. Oh, dude, I've been there. Yeah, that place is awesome. Slayer actually yeah, had my, a, a record release party there. Really? Yeah, we used to go when we were little kids. So then they'd come and pick us up when the show was over. And uh, pretty amazing that nothing ever happened. And uh, I don't know. It's just amazing that they, they trusted us and they, they didn't worry about us back yeah. then. Yeah. But- 
Well, you know, especially, I don't know if you went to any of the uh, really more hardcore shows I was just telling Matt about, you know, the Fender's Ballroom and when we went oh, to yeah. shows at the Olympic Auditorium and, and, and even when we saw like Motorhead, they were the, that was the first when the punks and the metalers came together when Motorhead played on the, um, with Brian Robertson uh, on the Iron right. Fist or the end, you know, and, and uh, with Crocus. But some of those Fender's Ballroom and, you know, you had a lot of the gangs coming over and uh, the yeah, Balboa Theater know. and... Uh, in downtown LA or around Watts. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy. And Fender's ballroom was pretty nuts too, man. Yeah, I remember seeing a merciful fate there actually at Fender's. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, Cause you and I, we saw him at the country club too with Exciter, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. The first time they could, a country yeah, club has some shows. great shows. Remember loudness first show. And we saw Ingve with Steeler totally. when Ingve first came into yep. town. We saw him at the radio city and the uh, country club. Show them all for one tour. That was one of the oh, best shows Raven. ever. That was yeah. awesome. Nice. Yeah, they did. Yeah, you uh, said that was a Raven. tour with Raven, right? Raven. Raven. That, that, yeah, that's that's, that's a classic long. tour. That's like no that was, people talk about it all the time. Uh, that, that was time. unbelievable, yeah. and they they were just amazing. And then Raven came back a year later with Anthrax when Anthrax put out the Fistful of Metal. Wow, and Striper. I don't know if you remember Bob, but uh, we we picked up Lars's mom for the Kill 'Em All for One show. Do you remember that? Was I in the car with you? Yeah, and she rode with us, and I was kind of worried that she'd be freaked out, but she was so much cooler than we were. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I do, I totally yeah. remember meeting her there, yeah. I, yeah. You know what, I think I went up with my buddy RT, and we met, we met up there. Well, maybe uh, Steve went with me, Steve Hallis maybe went with me. Yeah, but, but, but I, I do remember you introduced me to her, and I was kind of like tripping out, like, wow, his mom's super cool and like really proud of him, and yeah, which is cool. I guess any mom would be, but it was like, I'm thinking, wow, this that is kind like, of music yeah, stuff. You would yeah. think a mom would be like, oh, yeah. Well, you know, back then, oh. you know, the, the parents were super conservative, sure. or at least your, par- your parents were always pretty open. Pat, well, we, we could cut this out if you don't want to talk about it, Pat, but yeah. you had a funny story about when. You invited Lars to dinner, and he offered your dad to invest in the band. Yeah, he, he asked me. <laughs> oh, dude, you got to listen to this oh, story, yeah, man. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. But, but check that. This is the balls of some kid. Could you imagine some kid coming just to dinner to your parents yeah, and asking for investment? Oh, wait, but check, tell this story, story, Pat. This is hilarious. Yeah. Come over and, uh, you know, we'd listen to music and stuff, but we also would, um, we, you know, we had cable TV and, well, that's when the cord was still attached to that big click box. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And we'd watch, we'd wait for Iron Maiden videos, you know, those live videos sure. with Diana, and uh, we'd have to sit through the Huey Lewis and all that stuff and uh, Eddie Money, and but then he would stay late, uh, and like I'd go to bed and just yeah, just you know, close the door and you leave, and he'd watch tennis on our cable, and then he'd leave sometime in the middle of the night. You sure he but, wasn't watching those pornos that you got on, on TV <laughs> that you had to descramble, and you would have be, to watch yeah. a blurry photo? <laughs> Good be, that's funny. But then one time he said, hey, you know, do you think your dad would would be willing to invest in the band? And I'm going, I don't know, and I had no idea what he was going to ask for. I mean, you, know, you can ask him, you know, come back tomorrow, and uh, you can ask him, he shows up, and we all sat at the dinner table, my mom and my dad and Lars and me, and he he had a, like a professional, as much as a you know seventeen year old can be professional, wow. a presentation about the band. It was like I was like, ah, where did that come from? I wouldn't even know what to say. <laughs> but he asked my dad for ten grand. Holy but, shit! Really? Uh, oh, ten man. grand back then in nineteen eighty. Oh that's like a yeah, hundred like, grand, exactly. probably yeah. two hundred grand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Uh, and who who would do that? I well, mean, dude, that, if, if, I mean, I mean, who, band, yeah, if I invited cool some kid to dinner and they exactly. tell that in front of my like, dad, my dad would go, "Who the don't, fuck is it? Don't bring this kid around again." Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your dad's your probably dad kicking himself in the ass. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that just shows why Metallica <laughs> who they are where yes, they are. Absolutely. But in my dad, from my dad's point of view, who would have invested two hundred dollars in a in a little heavy metal band? Who would do it? Yeah. So what did your dad say uh, afterwards? I'm sure when he saw them getting big, he's like. Fuck, man, I could have, because back then he could have probably wrote his own thing. All right, give me, you know, I'll, I'll take 20% over the next 10 years. And Lars would have went, sure, okay, just give us 10 grand. Dude, we'll give you 50%. My dad has mentioned it, uh, you know, in the last few years. You remember when he, when he, you know, asked me to invest in the band? And he's like, just shakes his head, like, because he knows he should have done it now. But 
Who in their right mind would have? Especially for ten grand. That's a lot of money. That's for ten grand. Yeah. That's just so ballsy and ancillary. Yeah. Oh, didn't, didn't you take them to a party at Dana Point? They, uh, yeah. What was that whole story? Because I was going to go. Yeah. I remember I was going to go with you to that, and I don't know why I didn't. I, and that was a backyard party, somebody's house. And I have no idea whose house it was, but uh, he called me and said, hey, can you uh, pick me up and give me a ride to the party? And and I go, well, yeah, let me see if I can get my dad's car. I, you know, none of us had cars then. Sure. So my, my brother could said, I'll drive you. So we got my dad's Volvo. And somewhere... On the way there, the car overheated, and I remember I'm like an idiot unscrewing the radiator, and this geyser of <laughs> I did that antifreeze. Too. Uh, somehow, my brother got the car going again, and we got to the show, and and Dave Mustaine was furious because you know Lars was late a lot, really? and this time we would have been on time, but you know the car broke down, and uh, he just was. I thought he was going to kill Lars. He was so mad. Wow. And then we, we went into the backyard and the show never happened because when they were warming up, the police came. Dude, that's what happened all the time. And the, the thing is, usually they'll, the people that run, own the house will call the cops. Oh, they'll collect the money, <laughs> do the Get first song. The yeah. And there was another guy that I don't know if you ever met him. His name was Jeff McCann. He was a drummer. And uh, he had a band called Satan's Cheerleaders. No, was he was he your punk rock buddy? Punk, yeah, he was a he was punk rock buddy, and we'd go. He he ended up forming as a joke because uh, he'd broken up with a girl, or she'd broken up with him, and he formed this like anti-sex league, and it was a joke that ended up getting written up in Playboy, <laughs> and and a whole bunch of people at Cal State Long Beach joined this club seriously, and he he didn't say he'd tell me I don't know what to do. This is a joke, and everybody's taking me seriously. And he he knew Lemmy, and he knew the you know like Kelly Johnson, and and he knew uh, the Cramps. Yeah, you told me. Friend. I, I do remember this guy. I, you you introduced yeah. me to him. Yeah, didn't he run like Lemmy's fan club or something? Or uh, no, the- he had a buddy named Greg Yarde that that ran the Motorhead Appreciation Club of America. That was it. Yeah. Then Greg would send me and like Quintana like a stack of like girl school flyers before they played here. And he wanted us to hand them out. And I think I probably still have the, that stack of like a hundred flyers he'd sent me. That was another and, great uh, show at the whiskey. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was an amazing show. But he was a, Jeff was an interesting guy cause he was really into the whole punk scene, but then he started getting into motorhead or he was already into motorhead, but then he started getting into stuff like Bow Wow and he collected, started collecting Japanese heavy metal and, Interesting guy though, but we he and I would go to Middle Earth Records to you know just to look for metal records basically, or we'd go down to like to Melrose up in Hollywood to go to just looking for metal records. Th- those were the cool days of music market and uh, oh yeah, you know there was a funny story uh, Pat and I always tell about uh, how we knew Lars before you actually met him. We would go to music market and there was the <laughs> guy. There. At, well, no, the guy we would back then they would get like maybe a couple issues of Kerrang or a couple issues of okay. you know uh, Angel Witch uh, import or whatever uh, or you know so we would have to go there first as soon oh we got the new Kerrang and we would rush down there to go, yeah. we would go there Pat and I and then uh, the the guy at the uh, uh, front counter would go oh some Dutch kid just bought it <laughs> yeah. well he lived in Newport which was probably a little oh, bit how closer he knows Dutch kid just well, his accent well yeah, because of his accent I'm, yeah. you know, he's obviously Danish but he, he would yeah. always say some Dutch kid and Pat and I who were like who the fuck is this Dutch kid who else knows about this shit <laughs> yeah he'd also get all the uh, the neat singles before we'd get them yep and or or they they'd say uh, yeah you got the last one that Dutch kid was here and he bought them yeah. <laughs> and he buy a few copies of them yeah and you and I are thinking dude who else knows about this shit who the fuck is this Dutch kid <laughs> he wasn't even Dutch that was, was funny exactly too Dutch. yeah exactly. I know that was what was so yeah. funny about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember the first time I met him, I kept asking him about Holland. Oh, what was it like growing up in Holland? And he's probably going, I, I, I could just picture him going, are you stupid? Don't you know the difference Dutch, between Danish? Holland and Denmark? Denmark yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the first things he asked me, too, was about the lead weight cassette. And that was one of them that I saw it behind the counter at Music Market. That, now, you know, now, it only came me, out on a cassette back then. I had a, I had a discussion with someone. Now, Lead Weight was just released on cassette. Was Lead Weight ever on vinyl or no? It was. It was re- released in Italy 
on vinyl. I have that a copy of that too, but it was uh, okay, but originally but it was only set. Because I yeah. remember there was another Neat Records compilation called 60 Minutes of Metal or something like that. You remember that? I have that too. It later was released on vinyl with a different name and with tracks. Not not all the tracks were on it. And now I remember that had the, the uh, Lead Weight had like Inferno by Blitzkrieg and songs that weren't available uh, on other stuff, right? Yeah, and, and Inquisitor. The I remember putting the tape in and I'm going, God, I wonder if this is going to be good. And I heard the opening of Inquisitor and it was like, I just couldn't believe anything could sound that incredible. Yeah. Because it's what we were looking for, you know? Well, dude, those compilations back then, I mean, it obviously started with the Metal for Mothers. Volume yeah. 2 kind of sucked, but Brute Force was a great one. Uh, Heavy yeah. Metal Heroes, when Heavy Metal Records came. Ebony did, uh, what was the one on Ebony? Uh, 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 Rockster? Yeah, yeah, I think that was it. And then, uh, uh, well, the BBC so, one with, with Angel Witch and uh, Sweet Savage. Uh, BBC Friday Rock Show. Uh, yeah. Electric Warriors, New Electric Warriors had Vardis and uh, but th th that was a shit. The compilation records back then. Yeah, Rock Caliber was on Guardian, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. And Rock Snacks too. Yeah, that had like Hollow Ground, I think, and Saracen and uh, and Samurai. Yeah, and, uh... dude. I can't remember. I can't believe you remember this shit. Well, all right. Well, I, sh I guess we should probably close this out, man. Uh, good to meet you, Matt. Or good talking yeah, good to you. Good to meet you too, Pat. Man, really good to meet you, man. And dude, thanks well, again. Dude, again for people that don't know we just this was just going to be like a practice episode i said well let's call pat and we'll do this so this is actually uh this came out great this will be our debut proper episode of the brand new shockwave skull sessions completely unrehearsed absolutely <laughs> organic <laughs> <laughs> all right patrick always good talking to you man let's talk real soon take care hey, you too see you bob see you matt thank you for listening to the shockwave skull sessions podcast you can subscribe and listen to all episodes of the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spreaker, Google Play, and more. Be on the lookout real soon for our new website at www.shockwaveskullsessions.com. Go to our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for up-to-date news on the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Email all questions, comments, and suggestions to shockwaveskullsessions at gmail.com.